and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today's session. Uh, Dr. Babylonis is an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Science and Center on Drug and Alcohol Research at the University of Kentucky, a college of medicine, and is the director of the UK Cannabis Center. She has conducted several controlled studies examining the effects of cannabis and medical cannabinoids in the human laboratory and has an NIH funded program of research on the interaction effects of opioids and cannabinoids. So um, we'd like to welcome and thank uh, Dr. Babalonis for uh, being our speaker today. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Chris, and thank you all for having me here today. It's my pleasure uh, to be speaking to your group. Let me share my slides here. Okay, so today I will be talking to you all about cannabis in Kentucky with a focus on opioid interaction effects and their clinical impact. I don't have any relevant uh, conflicts of interest to uh, disclose at this time. So an outline for today's talk, I'll start with discussing a little bit about the cannabis legislation in Kentucky. I'll present data from three clinical research studies in which we explored opioid and cannabinoid interactions with controlled dosing in humans. And then I'll provide some summary and conclusions and some things to think about. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A at the end. So the learning gaps that I'll be talking about today and addressing is what is the safety profile of concurrent use of opioids and cannabinoids? What occurs in a therapeutic dose range? And what occurs at a high dose range in doses that are misused? And the learning objectives are to describe whether cannabinoids modify the abuse potential of opioids, indicate if cannabis acts as an analgesic or an opioid sparing agent when combined with opioids in the lab, and articulate if cannabinoids can alter the physiological effects and the safety of opioids. So just to provide a little bit of background, uh, this group is well informed about the risks and the dangers of opioid misuse and their consequences. Um, as we're dealing with the opioid epidemic um, here in the U.S. and across the globe, uh, cannabis use is also at peak levels at a global level. So the current estimate is that 4% of the global population currently uses cannabis. 55 million Americans reported using cannabis in the last year, uh, which is striking, and that's compared to 9.2 million individuals reporting past year opioid misuse. And the, the youngest group, the youngest cohort, 19 to 30, um, seems to have the highest rates of cannabis use. So 43% used in the past year, 29% of this group used in the past month, and 11% report using daily or near daily. Um, in Kentucky, the data are a little bit harder to come across, but the best estimates that we could find is that between 10 and 12% of Kentucky adults report past month cannabis use and that is somewhere between 17 and 20% in that younger age cohort, the 18 to 34 age group. But it's projected that these rates will continue to increase with the upcoming cannabis legislation, meaning the medical marijuana bill. So typically as states introduce new cannabis legislation, there's more uptake and there's more uh, cannabis use in those states that occurs. So I'll talk about the current legislation now, which is Governor Bashir's executive order on cannabis. And then I'll also talk about the upcoming official medical cannabis law that was just passed. So in November of last year, uh, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir signed an order to partially legalize medical cannabis. And I'll talk a little bit about what he did. He issued an executive order that allowed cannabis for patients who qualified in Kentucky, um, meaning that a physician would certify that a patient had been diagnosed with one of 21 qualifying conditions. Patients could purchase cannabis in a legal way, a legally sanctioned way um, in any state that permitted it. And they could have up to eight ounces, which is quite generous allocation. 
Um, so really heavy smokers who are smoking on a daily basis are typically using like one to maybe two ounces per month. So eight ounces it was quite generous uh, and quite a lot. This program started in, on January 1st, 2023 and is currently in effect. Um, and the way that the governor enacted this legislation is through his pardoning power. So all governors have very broad pardoning power. They can pardon people from death row. They can pardon people from legal implications. And so the governor is ordering a blanket pardon for anyone who may be in possession or using cannabis. And so this doesn't prevent someone from being arrested, but um, the idea is that it would pardon someone from legal implications if they were, if they did encounter law enforcement. Um, what this um, executive order does not do is it doesn't allow a legal marketplace. So right now there's no dispensaries in Kentucky. Um, there's no growing that's happening in Kentucky um, because this is just a part of a governor pardon. That's about to change though. Um, and these are the qualifying conditions that the governor allows. Again, but these are these are about to change to a more narrow uh, scope of conditions. So in January, 2025, um, the, the Senate Bill 47, which allowed medical cannabis in Kentucky will take effect there will be dispensaries in Kentucky, and the qualifying conditions will be six, um, cancer, chronic severe intractable pain, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, chronic nausea, and PTSD. And again, dispensaries are going to start to appear in Kentucky in 2025, and several different types of cannabis products will be legal in Kentucky for the first time. And re remember that physicians won't be able to dictate cannabis dose, product selection, route of administration, or frequency of use for their patients. Um, a physician is only certifying that a patient is eligible. And then once a patient has the eligibility card, they can go to a dispensary and purchase um, up to their legal limit, um, whatever products they choose, whatever route they choose to use through. Um, and so uh, physicians will not have much control over the actual products. Internet physicians can also certify patients. So right now, uh, even with the executive order, we have seen um, some internet physicians advertising $200 certifications for a 10 minute Zoom, Zoom appointment for patients to get their cards. Um, and the Cannabis Center is hoping to be able to gather de-identified patient data and dispensary purchase data once these dispensaries are open and operating, just to try to get a sense of um, what types of patients are coming, how much are they buying at once, and what types of products are they using. So now I'd like to just transition and uh, talk a little bit about our opioid and cannabinoid interaction research. Um, so as we know, cannabis and opioids are two of the most commonly misused drug classes, and they're also uh, widely used therapeutically. But despite the high rates of use and misuse, um, there's relatively few carefully controlled trials on the risks and benefits of their co-use. So just to provide a little bit of background of um, some of the reason that I'm uh, really highly interested in these types of studies is that there's been numerous rodent and primary primate studies that have demonstrated that cannabinoid agonists like cannabis, like THC, um, CB1 agonists are opioid sparing, which means they reduce the opioid dose needed for analgesia, that they don't alter the reinforcing effects of opioids, so how much an animal is willing to work to gain access to an opioid, um, and don't alter opioid-induced respiratory depression. Again, this is all in animal studies, and so that's really compelling and very interesting, um, and it seems like there's a lot of potential for cannabinoid um, effects and good therapeutic effects. 
And these findings have implications for clinical care as well. Um, but there's very few human studies that have examined opioid and cannabinoid combinations to really look at all these things. So we don't know uh, a lot about its, its abuse potential, the safety and physiological effects, the analgesic effects, and the behavioral and cognitive impact when we're putting these drugs together. And so I hope to take you through a series of studies that will help answer some of these questions. And so um, the questions that we're hoping to answer today are, are cannabinoids able to reduce the opioid dose needed for pain relief? Do cannabinoids alter opioid abuse potential? Do cannabinoids modify the risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression? And are cannabinoids able to alleviate opioid withdrawal? So study one is a therapeutic dose interaction study. Um, so again, one of the reasons that we're interested in a therapeutic model of these drug interactions is because the animal, animal studies suggest that very low doses of mu opioid agonists um, and cannabinoid agonists produce synergistic effects on analgesia, meaning that um, the sum is greater than its parts. So low levels of analgesia um, with cannabinoids alone, with opioids alone, but when you put them together, there's a really huge increase in analgesia, and again, in animal studies. And again, in the animal studies, uh, they have been there, the, the data suggests that you can um, reduce the opioid dose needed for analgesia by three and a half times if you have a cannabinoid agonist on board. And in these animal studies, there's again, no increases in outcomes related to abuse potential. So the aims of this study that we conducted in humans were to examine the analgesic effects of dronabinol or marinol, which is a synthetic THC product that is FDA approved and is marketed um, and can be prescribed alone and in combination with oxycodone across a therapeutic dose range for both agents. And we use several laboratory models of acute pain among healthy participants. And so in this study, we were really looking at the safety and tolerability of opioid and cannabinoid combinations. And we're also interested in the physiological and subjective and psychomotor effects. So to do this study, uh, it was a within-subject, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study. We enrolled healthy adults ages 18 to 50 that had no chronic or acute pain and no current drug misuse. We gave relatively low doses of dronabinol, so placebo 2.5 and 5 milligrams, which those are very low doses. Uh, the starting dose for dronabinol is 2.5 and oxycodone 0, 5, and 10, also relatively low doses. Um, those are the starting doses for acute pain. And again, these were administered um, orally via capsule. And so we looked at those doses alone and in combination. And so uh, each of those combinations required nine experimental sessions. And again, we're looking at experimental pain physiological effects and safety and abuse potential. And 10 participants completed this study. And I have here listed the experimental pain assays that we conducted. The details aren't super important here, but just to realize that um, these are participants who do not have chronic pain, who are coming into the lab and we're giving them painful sensations and asking them, at what point do they first detect pain? which we call threshold, and what point is at which that pain is no longer tolerable, which we call tolerance. And so that, that's uh, the two key outcomes that I'll be presenting. And so this is a graph that shows oxycodone alone on one of those pain outcomes. And so we're applying a lot of pressure to someone's hand and we're asking, um, how much does this hurt and how much can you tolerate it? And so what we're seeing here is that oxycodone increases the amount of pressure they can tolerate, which means oxycodone is acting as expected and is providing an analgesic effect. This is without any THC on board at all. 
And so this is the first graph. And again, as you move up on this graph, it, it indicates more analgesic effect, more pain relief as you move up. And I'll show you the data with THC. And so when THC is on board, it alone, the triangle above the zero, does not produce any analgesic effects on its own at low dose. And it also decreases the analgesia that's produced by oxycodone. So suggesting that it might be blocking some of the analgesic effects of oxycodone. And then a high dose, a higher dose of THC doesn't really modify the effects of oxycodone. So what we're seeing here is that THC is not boosting the analgesic effects of oxycodone, but it's rather either leaving it alone or decreasing it a little bit. And that's what we'll see throughout these next set of slides. So this is um, how much heat can a person tolerate. Um, THC uh, does not increase the amount of heat that someone can tolerate when combined with oxycodone and uh, may slightly decrease it um, when you increase the dose of THC and combine it with oxycodone. And this is how much cold, ice cold water someone can tolerate having their arm in. Um, 2.5 looks like it's maybe decreasing it. Um, and five milligrams of THC is, is leaving it alone or decreasing it a little bit. However, when you're asking someone, do you feel any drug effect? So how much uh, sensation are you getting from these drugs? Do you feel any just overt drug effects? You can see that the circles are um, oxycodone alone, so they're feeling the oxycodone. They're not feeling the THC alone very much because these are relatively low doses. However, when you're combining the two in, in the uh, top line of the squares, um, especially with the higher dose of THC, they really feel it. And so this is kind of like a synergistic effect that we were talking about earlier, that um, there are effects um, of each drug on their own. But when you put them together, they look like they might be the greater than the sum of their parts, um, which is concerning because we know that we don't want to increase the abuse potential of oxycodone. And this gives us a slight signal that, we're, that that's what's happening. Um, when we ask the question a few different ways, how much do you like the drug effect? How high are you? And does the drug have any bad effects? We see a lot of the same effects popping out. Um, when we are, are giving a high, the highest dose combination, they're liking the drug effect. They're feeling high in that middle panel. <clears throat> and then they're also having some bad effects associated with these as well. So to summarize study one, there's limited evidence for gernabinol to produce analgesia. It produced placebo-like ratings on subjective outcomes. Gernabinol either attenuated, meaning decreased, or did not alter oxycodone analgesia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oxycodone produced vomiting in four participants, and that was not altered when gernabinol was on board. And so typically we think of that as being a good anti-nausea medicine, and it didn't function as that in this dose range, in this scenario. And Dronabina also enhanced oxycodone subjective and observer ratings of drug effect. And so taken together, these data don't suggest that Dronabina is an option for opioid sparing medication. So it increased the abuse potential and it didn't help um, the analgesic effects. And so that's not a good combination for a therapeutic uh, pain reliever. Study two, we're moving towards a drug misuse model. So in this study, we're looking at the same basic interaction effect, but we're using inhaled cannabis, so smoked marijuana, on response to intranasal oxycodone. So we know that people misuse opioids through a variety of routes of administration, misuse uh, cannabis through a variety of, of routes. And so in this study, we picked inhaled cannabis, and we're pushing the doses quite high to 30 milligrams, and also pushing the doses of oxycodone quite high of 30, up to 30 milligrams of snorted opioid. And 
in this study, we're looking at primarily the same outcomes um, of use-related subjective effects. So how much do we think that these drugs will be misused? The physiological effects that determine dose safety. We did one experimental pain um, assay and then psychomotor effects. This was a within subject, double blind, placebo controlled randomized study again. This was an inpatient study. So all the participants lived at the UK research wing uh, in, the, in the UK hospital with us. Um, we conducted two safety sessions and then nine experimental sessions where we looked at various dose combinations of inhaled cannabis and intranasal opioids. And participants, again, were healthy adults. These folks had current non-medical use of cannabis and opioids, but they were not physically dependent on opioids, so they're not having a withdrawal syndrome occurring. Um, they can um, tolerate days without opioids, uh, without getting sick. So nine participants were included in this data analysis. All were daily cigarette smokers. Um, and these are relatively light opioid users, um, so using like roughly nine to 10 times per month-ish, um, but are using cannabis a little bit more heavily with an average about 22 out of, out of 30 day use. And then are, they're using other drugs quite in, infrequently. So again, we're using a relatively higher doses of inhaled cannabis and intranasal oxycodone. We're giving them in combination, separated by 15 minutes. Um, and we're having participants inhale through a volcano vaporizer and they're snorting oxycodone in, uh, and we're placing powder into two lines. We're using 18% THC cannabis, uh, which is roughly equivalent to the cannabis that is available in dispensaries and USP grade oxycodone powder. Okay, and so I have already mentioned the measures that we are really interested in. And this is a graph, uh, a time course graph that's asking participants, how much do you like the drug effects? And so the data that I'm showing here is just oxycodone 15 milligrams. And there, it's the same data on the left and on the right at this point. Um, and I'll build this slide as we, as we uh, talk about it. And so this is the effects um, on a scale from zero to 100. They're rating how much they like the drug. And we're looking from baseline, which is labeled BL, which is before we're giving the drug, through six and a half hours after we're giving the drug. So time point zero is when they get the drug. And so this is how much they are rating, how much they like 15 milligrams of oxycodone. THC 10 is gonna appear on the left and THC 30 will appear on the right. And so you can see that this is THC alone in the triangles. 10 on the left again and 30 on the right, that they are feeling pretty good drug liking effects from, the, from those doses. And then these are the drugs when put together. So the squares. Um, and so on the left, you can see that the combination is not really uh, increased so much above and beyond the separate entities, the set two separate drugs. On the right, when you put 30 milligrams and 15 milligrams of oxycodone together, you're seeing a little bit of a shift that it's enhancing the drug effects, but it's not a dramatic effect. When we give oxycodone 30 milligrams, this is what they're reporting feeling across time. We're giving, again, THC 10 and THC 30, and they're feeling those effects. And then we'll see what happens when we put those two drugs together. So THC-10 and Oxy-30, again, aren't producing too much of an effect um, that's greater than just THC alone. However, when you do the high-dose combination, pushing both of the doses relatively high, you're seeing a pretty good separation. And so those peak effects, um, they're, they are feeling the drug more intensely for longer. Um, and so the duration of those peak effects is extended 
And then the whole curve is basically extended as well. And so we're seeing a lot of potentiation there. And so we can summarize this as area under the curve. So literally, what is the area that that, that curve encompasses? And so this is the this is the same data replotted in a summary outcome graph. And so what we're seeing is oxycodone alone in the circles, THC 10 in the triangles, and THC 30 in the squares. And as you can see, um, in the dose combination, the highest dose combination, we're seeing a pretty significant effect above and beyond THC alone or oxycodone alone. How high are you is giving us a similar effect. And then we're asking, what is the street value of those doses on the left? And do you feel any drug effect on the right? And we're seeing the same effects emerge is that the uh, high dose combination is producing quite an enhancement above and beyond a THC and oxycodone alone. When we ask them, do you feel any marijuana effects? The high dose combination is enhancing cannabis effects. So what this means is that opioids are enhancing marijuana-like effects, and then marijuana is enhancing opioid-like effects as well. So that's quite interesting that they're feeling enhanced effects um, from both drugs. We're also seeing um, poor coordination scores increase. And this is the cold presser test again, which is how much cold can they tolerate? We're not seeing an enhanced effect when we put these drugs together for an the analgesic effect. So um, participants can't tolerate any more cold from the dose combinations than they can um, from either drug alone. But for things like pupil diameter, so the physiological effects, we're not seeing cannabis modify pupil diameter, which uh, we think of as an assay to determine uh, how much of an effect we're getting from an opioid, a physiological effect from an opioid. That's not changing. And this is the, the outcome measure that I have been most interested in throughout these series of studies is respiratory depression. And so this is what's called end tidal CO2. And the, the higher that you go on this graph means that there's more respiratory depression. Lower on the graph means less respiratory depression. So opioids alone are increasing respiratory depression slightly, which we would expect but THC is not enhancing those effects. And so that's something that I've been really concerned about and really worried about, but at least at these doses, we're not seeing that cannabinoids are making respiratory depression even worse. So to summarize, when administered alone, both oxycodone and cannabis produce, it, produce their expected effects. Cannabis increased a full array of subjective ratings and increased heart rate, which I didn't show, um, but cannabis does increase heart rate. And when the two drugs are combined, there were significant increases in both the peak and the duration of those effects, particularly at the high doses. And cannabis did not alter opioid-specific physiological effects, so it did not um, change respiratory depression, and it did not markedly change opioid-induced analgesia. So to summarize this study, this study joined several others indicating a great increased abuse potential from cannabis and opioid misuse, co-use. And uh, this is somewhat worrisome for those using these drugs together for both therapeutic and non-medical use. The study provides no evidence that these dose combinations produce enhancing algesia, which is um, inconsistent with the suggestion that cannabis produces opioid sparing effects. And again, there was no evidence under these dose conditions of additive or synergistic effect on physiological risk, like respiratory function, suggesting that it's potentially a safe combination to explore for future therapeutic effects Although we're acknowledging that there's abuse potential there, it is not increasing physiological risk at this time. And so moving on to study three, 
um, cannabinoids and their impact on opioid withdrawal outcomes. So again, the, the reason that we were interested in this topic, how do cannabinoids impact opioid withdrawal, is that several animal studies suggest that cannabinoid agonists like THC can attenuate opioid withdrawal, meaning that it can lessen the effects of opioid withdrawal, and that cannabinoid antagonists, so drugs that block the THC receptor, can also precipitate opioid withdrawal in opioid-dependent animals, suggesting that there's a really big component to um, cannabinoid component to opioid withdrawal outcomes. Um, the other reason that to be interested in these data is that there's current U.S. legislation whereby six United States have six states in the United States have opioid use disorder as a qualifying condition for medical cannabis. Kentucky is not one of those, um, but there are six states that suggest that cannabis uh, could be a useful tool for opioid use disorder. However, uh, there's no reliable clinical data suggesting that cannabis is effective for opioid withdrawal or any other aspect of OUD. And so that's another reason that we were that we continue to be interested in this topic. And so the purpose of this study was to test whether a cannabinoid agonist could attenuate opioid withdrawal in humans. So we enrolled healthy adults, 18 to 50. They were physically dependent on and misusing short-acting opioids, and they all had objective signs of opioid withdrawal. They all were using little to no cannabis at the time of the study. Um, in, in preceding the study. Again, this was within subject randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It was inpatient where they lived for five weeks at the UK hospital. And we conducted several experimental sessions with a minimum of 72 hours apart. Um, and so because these participants were physically dependent on opioids and would get sick when they stopped, we had an opioid maintenance dose procedure where they got doses of oral oxycodone around the clock. To examine withdrawal, we substituted placebo for three of those oxycodone maintenance doses right before their session to, to have them experience spontaneous opioid withdrawal for a period of time. So we could observe that and then give the THC to see if it was therapeutic. And so we tested placebo oxycodone as a positive control. So if you're in opioid withdrawal, one would hope that oxycodone would help that, um, what an opioid agonist would help. And then what did dronabinol do? We tested a wide range of doses of dronabinol. Um, and, the, and the final dose um, schedule was five, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams. And we looked at an array of physiologic and opioid agonist effects, abuse liability measures, and we're looking at all these outcomes for six hours after we're dosing. And this is, again, the time course effects from do you feel any drug effects? So these participants are in withdrawal at the time. We're giving them a dose range of dronabinol um, and two doses of active doses of oxycodone on the right. And we're asking them, how much do you feel the drug effect? And so they're feeling these drugs um, appropriately, and these are significant effects. We're also querying how severe is your opioid withdrawal. So on the left, you can see that um, placebo in the circles, placebo dronabinol is not doing anything. Their uh, withdrawal is still very high on a scale from zero to 100. And if you see a decrease on this scale, that means their withdrawal is going down and they're feeling better. So dronabinol or THC is decreasing their opioid withdrawal effects somewhat, but it's not a super robust effect. So it is occurring, but we think of this as more of a modest um, decrease in opioid withdrawal. Whereas if you give an opioid agonist like oxycodone, it's really bringing down their withdrawal scores to a significant degree. When we conduct observer-rated opioid withdrawal scales, um, 
where we're looking at just objective um, identifiable signs of opioid withdrawal, the high dose of dronaminol is decreasing those opioid withdrawal scale scores. Um, and then so is oxycodone. And then on the right, um, a similar scale is showing some effect of a 20 milligram dose of THC in 30, and then both the oxycodone doses. When you ask participants how sick do they feel and are asking them validated um, withdrawal measures, the same effects are occurring. So they're feeling some uh, moderate or relief at 20 and 30 milligrams of THC on both of these outcomes, as well as uh, oxycodone is also producing those effects. When we ask how high are you and how much do you like the drug, uh, 20 and 30 milligrams of THC is increasing the high and 60 milligrams of oxycodone is as well. And then how much do you like the drug? They're not um, overly endorsing that they're liking the THC, um, but of course they are liking the um, opioid agonist. One of the limitations to this study, the dose limitations to this study um, was heart rate. And so you can imagine if, um, if you are seeing an, a, some, a moderate effect of THC to suppress opioid withdrawal um, at the highest dose, you would probably ask, well, why don't you just increase the dose even further? Because then that might look a whole lot better and people might get more relief, which is a really logical assumption. But in practice, we see a limitation to how much THC we can give under these circumstances. So um, this is heart rate um, plotted from baseline to six hours after drug administration. And um, we can see that um, THC is increasing heart rate. But when you get to, we initially started with 40 mil. I uh, gave 40 milligrams of THC in the yellow symbols, their heart rate was way too high when we pushed the dose higher. So um, their heart rate is getting up to 150, 130, very, um, and they're having panic attacks and anxiety when they're getting that much THC on top of opioid withdrawal. And so that wasn't a safe scenario. And so that dose had to be discontinued, and we had to stick at, at the high dose of the highest dose of thirty milligrams for the remainder of the participants. And that's also producing tachycardia uh, in the range of about one ten, but it's not at the really unsafe levels that we were seeing from the high dose of THC. So to summarize this study, dronabinol five and ten were placebo like. Dronabinol 20 and 30 produced dose-related increases in ratings of feeling high, and they modestly attenuated or decreased some of the opioid withdrawal outcomes. 30 milligrams increased bad effects, and again, if we, when we pushed the dose um, higher to 40 uh, with two participants, we had to discontinue that due to sustained tachycardia and anxiety and panic-like reactions. So overall, Higher doses of dronabinol, dronabinol modestly attenuate or decrease some of the signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal, but um, safety, including high heart rate, remains a significant concern. So those are the three studies that I wanted to present and to provide data, um, and also wanted to give you an idea about where we're going with this research. So our next studies are a self-administration study so we are looking at inhaled cannabis at high doses um, and intranasal opioids at high doses to determine if giving somebody cannabis alters how much they want to take an opioid. So in the lab, we um, have them work for drug and we have them work for uh, up to a full high dose of an opioid drug. And so we're trying to determine, does cannabis make them want that drug even more? Does it make them want opioids less or does it leave it alone? And then we're also doing the reverse. What does opioids 
what do what does an opioid dose do to their desire to take cannabis? Does it increase their want for cannabis, decrease it, or does it leave it alone? Um, and so that's a study that we're um, about to start enrolling for. And then we also have a grant to look at inhaled cannabis in patients um, with opioid use disorder and physical dependence. And so we're, we're going to um, take that last study that I presented with dronabinol and um, give them doses of smoked marijuana instead of dronabinol. And we'll look at different cultivars, different strains of marijuana. So we'll look at high THC uh, cannabis. We'll look at CBD and THC in the cannabis. We'll look at several different doses of several different strains or cultivars of, of cannabis. And we'll look at, again, opioid withdrawal severity, response to high dose opioids. So in this study, we're going to give them a high dose of an opioid and also a dose of cannabis to see how that might change respiratory depression, abuse potential, um, some of the things that we had been looking at, but in a model of folks with um, severe opioid use disorder. Um, and we'll do this by looking at acute doses of cannabis. And then the, the study that I'm really excited about is we'll also give them repeated cannabis doses. So we'll give them cannabis three times a day for seven days and then put them through opioid withdrawal to see what does chronic cannabis do, not just one dose of cannabis. What does a background of cannabis use do to opioid withdrawal? Is that, is that somehow protective or does it, does it make it worse or does it leave it alone? And um, I think that models more of the real world types of use that we're seeing. And so I'm, I'm quite excited uh, for those series of studies. We are also conducting a, a, a cancer trial through the UK Cannabis Center, where patients with cancer will be randomized into one of four arms. We have three active dosing arms and placebo, and we'll give them an edible uh, cannabis dose daily for four months. And we'll uh, look at cancer burden, pain, quality of life, safety and tolerability, and how much they're utilizing opioids. So can, can, does cannabis decrease their opioid doses? Does it leave it alone or does it maybe increase their opioid dose requirement? Um, and then we'll start to assess the highest tolerated dose to begin to try to suggest what might be a reasonable dose range for patients. So to provide some summary and conclusions on this topic, um, so to answer our question, do cannabinoids enhance opioid analgesia in humans? The data that I presented here today suggests no, not in, in a lab environment. But what have other people found? Um, other people have done high quality lab studies and found no analgesic effect of THC alone. Some studies report a modest effect of one dose combination, so like a really low dose of a cannabinoid and opioid, but it's not a robust effect. It's pretty, it's pretty modest. But all the studies are showing that abuse potential is increased when you put some sort of THC agonist, CB1 agonist, and a mu opioid agonist together. And so what does the clinical data say? Um, there was one clinical trial that looked at post-surgical administration of nabilone, which is a THC agonist. Um, and they found that THC did not al alter morphine consumption after surgery and pain scores actually increased with morphine. Um, and so that's suggesting that um, THC in this case is enhancing morphine yield morphine effect. So, or sorry, is enhancing the pain and morphine is not helping that. And so that's a concerning fact. Um, and then there's several correlational studies with, which suggest that cannabis users require more anesthesia and more post-op pain medication than controls. 
Um, and so um, there, there's not really great data right now to suggest that cannabinoids are helping with pain. Um, in a very nice review article um, that has been recently published, um, they were asking this exact question, can, do cannabinoids have opioid sparing effects for analgesia? Can you give less opioid and still maintain analgesic effect with THC? And they're saying quite clearly this is happening in preclinical studies and in observational studies, but in high quality randomized controlled trials, there's no evidence that this occurs in humans. Um, similarly, the um, International Association for Pain issued a white paper. They, looked, they did a meta-analysis and issued a position paper and they're the experts on pain. And so what they're saying is that their bottom line statement is due to the lack of high quality evidence, they don't endorse the general use of cannabis and cannabinoids for pain relief. And um, new guidelines for anesthesiologists were also just released suggesting that anesthesiologists start screening patients for cannabis use before surgery um, because they're detecting on these same sorts of effects that regular users of cannabis may have more pain and nausea after surgery rather than less. And they're asking anesthesiologists to ask and adjust their practice based on patients who endorse cannabis use. So again, kind of the opposite of what we're being told by the media that cannabis is a very, very good pain reliever. Um, it may be in some circumstances, but the majority of the data that are occurring, that are coming out and the really well-controlled data that are coming out are suggesting that it's actually the flip, that we're not really seeing good pain relief when we're putting the two together. And then to answer the question, do cannabinoids enhance the abuse potential of opioids? Um, every study that has asked this question in a controlled manner um, and that, have it, have, that has examined abuse potential, all have demonstrated that cannabis increases opioid abuse potential. Um, and so this is also, I think, the flip of, of what we're typically told in the media, at least the, the news stories that I see are always suggesting that um, maybe uh, if you use cannabis, you will feel less effects from an opioid or one of, you would desire opioids less. But when we're looking at this in a carefully controlled way, we're seeing the opposite is that cannabis is enhancing opioid abuse potential. Um, and then one more naturalistic study followed participants who had opioid use disorder for 90 days. And what they're reporting is that on days when they can consumed cannabis, the odds that they also used opioids were two times greater. And so um, that's a correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean cannabis is causing that, but it also is kind of a strike against cannabis in this sense as well. Um, it, it, it enhances the idea that it may have um, problematic effects for people who have OUD. And then can we answer the question, do cannabinoids alleviate opioid withdrawal? Um, aside from the study that um, I presented, there was another high quality controlled trial um, where they gave THC, dronabinol, and 30 milligrams or placebo for five weeks. And they found really modest short-term, meaning three-day, decreases in opioid withdrawal. But again, uh, those effects were rather modest, but there was no effect of study retention or rates on induction in, onto naltrexone, which is the study goal. And so our data align with uh, this idea that it's not a profound effect. There's no profound um, alleviation of opioid withdrawal with cannabinoids, although we're still continuing to do this work. I also wanted to um, provide some uh, context for what is cannabis, the, uh, the 
impact of cannabis on outcomes related to MOUD um, and patients enrolled in those therapy programs. And the data are mixed. Um, there are just a few studies that suggest that cannabis may be beneficial for those who are taking MOUD, um, such that cannabis daily users do better, uh, use less non-medical opioids than occasional users of cannabis. Although this study, I'll, I'll be honest, was quite shaky. Um, there was no difference between people who didn't use cannabis at all and the daily users of cannabis. It was only um, daily cannabis users versus occasional cannabis users on the outcome of non-medical opioid use. And so it's a little shaky, but it's showing that daily cannabis users are doing better. The large majority of the data, um, several meta-analyses and la large cohort studies are finding no association. So they're finding that uh, patients enrolled in MOUD programs don't have any difference um, that from uh, using cannabis or not using cannabis, it doesn't matter. And one study looked at all medication types of MOUD and found no difference in cannabis users versus non-users. And then a small subset of studies is also is suggesting that there's higher risk for cannabis users. So greater risk of non-medical opioid use in women receiving um, methadone maintenance therapy and greater risk of heroin use enroll, um, in those enrolled in the, uh, MMT uh, when, they're, when they're using cannabis. And so the, the landscape is a bit mixed, um, but the, the large majority of the data is showing no association between the two. Um, and so with that said, I think I wanted to talk a little bit about the public messaging that is out there. Um, and so these are headlines, is we the secret to beating opioid addiction? Um, on the left, um, there was a very popular billboard that was displayed in several states with medical cannabis laws saying that states that legalize marijuana had 25% fewer opioid related deaths than those that had no cannabis laws. And then the, um, the stickers and the signs that we're seeing in dispensaries is that cannabis is the solution to the opioid epidemic. And so I just wanted to put um, some of this into context um, and to share that some of this is occurring and help us kind of think through as a group um, why, these why this messaging is harmful. Um, so in addition, some dispensaries are recommending that patients actually stop using their FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder and start using cannabis instead um, without any data that cannabis can help in any aspect of this terrible disorder um, that is taking so many lives. Um, they're suggesting that their life-saving medicines should be stopped. And again, the current uh, legislation is that 16 U.S. states are saying that opioid use is a, um, opioid use disorder is a qualifying condition for cannabis, but there's no reliable clinical data suggesting that cannabis is effective for opioid withdrawal or any other aspect of OUD. There's no pharmacological protection against overdose. Um, there's no um, instances that we have found that it's reducing craving or it's actually doing the opposite. It's enhancing opioid effects. And so um, I just want to share those concerning um, messages and say that those, the billboards that are being put up that state that in states with medical cannabis laws, there are 25% fewer opioid overdose fatalities. That's a correlational study that was published um, I think in 2014, um, and th there were lots of caveats in that paper that says like, be really careful with what you do with this association because this is simply a correlation and it does not mean this is causative. We're just noticing that this is a relationship. Since then, several other studies have reported the opposite relationship, um, that there's been an increase in overdose mortality in states with medical cannabis. Um, 
And those studies, one was published in the best journal in science, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science. Um, that got far less attention than that first study that showed that cannabis could be protective. When you show the opposite, that cannabis is not protective or could not be protective, it did not, it did not get any press um, or any public attention. But overall, I would caution everyone with their interpretation of either one of these studies and either one of these um, effects, because these are, again, correlational state-level relationship. It does not mean that people who are using cannabis die less from opioid overdose or die more from opioid overdose than people who don't take it, because we're not looking at post-mortem toxicology screens to find this out. It's just saying that simply in a state that has this law, what are their rates of opioid overdose? It does not mean that there's a pharmacological interaction. It's not a causative relationship. And there's potential for every confound. And so regardless of um, the nature of that relationship, whether it cannabis may cause, may be associated with more or less opioid overdoses, those data should be interpreted with really great caution. Um, and so to provide some conclusions in a final summary, uh, cannabis and THC's effects on opioid analgesia are mixed, but high quality randomized controlled trials have not demonstrated any benefit. THC also does not appear to reduce the harms associated with opioids. There's no evidence um, that THC ameliorates opioid-induced respiratory depression. That's a common theme in some of the public messaging is that THC will pharmacologically prevent an overdose. Um, we don't see any instance that that's occurring. On the flip side, we don't see any instances in our controlled studies that THC could enhance respiratory depression either. Um, THC, though, does very clearly appear to increase abuse potential when combined with opioids. Um, THC may provide some modest relief from opioid withdrawal, but the data as it stands right now is that the side, of, side effect profile is not ideal from that drug because it's causing a high heart rate. And again, there's no pharmacological protection against serious opioid harms uh, with THC. And overall, additional research is going to help us clarify the risk and benefit profile of these medication interactions. And just want to acknowledge um, everyone who worked on these studies, just really quickly, the research participants, um, the research collaborators, Dr. Lothwell um, led study two and was an integral part of all of these uh, studies that we have conducted. And so She's really the heart of our research program and the other physicians um, who have worked with us over the years, um, funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and then uh, funding from the Kentucky Legislature and the UK Cannabis Center.